Okay, so uh, uh, I think uh, it's 11 Amsterdam time already. So let's start the session. So my name is uh, Xiaohui Bao. I'm from University of Science and Technology of China. It's, uh, it's my honor to chair this session. So this is the invited talk. It, uh, it will be given by Simon Graublacher from Delft University of Technology. Uh, today he's going to talk about optical mechanical quantum memory. Uh, due to the internet uh, connection is not so stable for the speaker. So we will play a pre-recorded video instead. After the uh, after we play the video, so the speaker will be available uh, will be available for questions. Okay, so uh, please play the video. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be here today and tell you a little bit about what we do in in Delft in my group, and in particular, we'll talk about some of the quantum information processing tasks that we do with optomechanical. Um, systems in Delft. So let me start by um, introducing a little bit the, the lab and and our, our main focus. So as you see in the in the center here is a generic overview of, um, of one of our systems. So it's an optomechanical system where you have a mass on a spring essentially. Let me find my, my cursor here. So you have here a mass on a spring with a frequency omega um, and it's coupled of course to the environment. And this um, mechanical oscillator sits inside a, an optical cavity. So you have photons going back and forth between two mirrors where one of the end mirrors is this mechanical system. And now you have momentum that um, gets transferred from the um, optical field onto the mechanical system. And you can do interesting um, measurements. You can create interesting quantum states of the mechanical system through this optomechanical interaction. And we do this in, in various different directions. So first of all, we work here um, at room temperature with um, relatively big, typically silicon nitride um, membranes. Um, you see two here, um, essentially um, what we do is we, we try to create quantum states at room temperature of this mechanical system and try to um, use them for, for sensing applications. And then here on the bottom right is um, what we work on is quantum sensing. And this can range from building um, better sensors with mechanical systems, that are close to the quantum regime or in the quantum regime, or as well, and this is what is shown here, measuring quantum forces. Um, for example, in this case, we measured the, um, the Casimir force between two relatively long strings with a superconductor and, and tested the Casimir force above and below the TC of the, um, of the material. Um, then on the bottom left here is a little bit of a, of a different approach. We, we use our, um, essentially our fabrication expertise um, to, to build um, scanning tunneling microscopy tips, so STM tips, and we try to functionalize them um, with, for example, gigahertz readout. And, and so this is in collaboration with a, with a group in Leiden. Um, and then on the, on the top left here is, is kind of our workhorse, and this is also what I'm going to talk about today, is um, we look at um, mechanical oscillators, optomechanical systems at millikelvin temperatures, and we create quantum states of the mechanical system, use them for quantum information processing tasks. And um, yeah, and, and this is typically done at really Kelvin temperatures. All right. So what's our general motivation to do optomechanics and in particular this, this quantum optomechanics? So originally, um, this is also I think where the field comes from a little bit is um, the question of is there a, a size or mass limit um, for quantum systems? So is there a transition um, region between quantum and classical um, physics, where you make a system large enough and you can't see any quantum effects on it. So essentially, we, we try to make bigger and bigger systems and still observe quantum effects and test if there's like some sort of decoherence mechanism that actually creates um, classical states rather than quantum states. Um, now, the next thing is we, we built this really um, high quality mechanical systems for our optomechanics experiments. and um, the question here is, is um, can we um, do better sensing with a mechanical system that's close to the quantum regime and, and really build very, very um, good sensors um, for various forces and using these optomechanical um, cavities. And then last but not least is um, the 
um, more um, applied aspect in, in quantum technology at the moment, um, can we use our mechanical systems as quantum information processing um, devices, for example, for creating entanglement, for building a quantum memory, and so on and so forth. So what does the system look like that we actually use? And this is, this is again, now for this, for this millicalvin optomechanics that we do. So I, I'm showing you here essentially what we call a nanobeam. Um, what it is, it's, it's effectively typically made of silicon or some other materials, some other dielectric, um, a waveguide with um, a photonic crystal um, made into the waveguide. So essentially these holes that you see here are photonic crystals. And you see here, this region on the left here is essentially a mirror. So it has a band gap for a certain wavelength. And at the same time, we make the same mirror on the other side. So we build a cavity and then we adiabatically change um, the whole shape and size into a defect where we essentially change the, the band gap and you can make the light that's now reflected by these mirrors, you can make it resonant in here. So you effectively really build an optical cavity. At the same time, this very same structure is also a, an, a cavity for mechanical vibrations, so for phonons. So you build an optomechanical um, cavity where both the photons and the phonons are very strongly confined in the center of this, of this beam, and therefore very strongly interacting. So it's really realizing this generic view on the top right here into um, a, a nanofabricated um, system that, that I'm showing you here. So this nano beam. And if you look then at the, at the um, finite element simulation of the system, so you can see here, you have the, um, the optical mode. It's nicely confined in the center of this, um, this beam. And if you then look at a, at a typical measurement of the optical resonance, this is what it looks like. So around typically 1550 nanometers of telecom wavelength, um, we see a nice optical resonance inside this optomechanical cavity. The same is true for, for the mechanics. So you see in the, in the same spot, there's also a mechanical mode that's confined. It's this kind of breathing mode that oscillates at several gigahertz. So in the case of silicon for this particular um, design, we have a mechanical frequency of around five gigahertz. So this is shown here in measurement on the, on the bottom right. Now, What's interesting is so optical quality factors, you can typically reach a few hundred thousand up to a million or so, depending on, on how well the fabrication run goes. Then the mechanical frequency we said is around five gigahertz. And now the mechanical quality factor very, very strongly depends on temperature. So at room temperature, it's typically on the order of a few thousand. Whereas if you cool it down, it can range between, I would say like a few hundred thousand to a million up to um, about 10 billion, I think, has been the highest zone. So 10 to the 10 um, quality factor. And, and that's essentially you have to add additional shielding and additional phononic shield. And I'll show you this a little bit later, how that works. Um, so this is really, you can very nicely tune your um, mechanical quality factor depending on the needs for the experiment. And then what's also interesting is, is the um, optomechanical coupling strength. So this is about a megahertz. So if you look at the, at the um, mechanical decay, that coupling rate is larger. Um, however, if you look at the um, optical line width, then this is about a few hundred megahertz or so for a few hundred thousand time quality factor. So the coupling rate is, is significantly smaller, about two to three orders of magnitude than the, um, than the cavity method. So we're not in a strong coupling regime, regime if, we, if we just look at a single photon, but if you pump the cavity hard enough, then, then you can actually get into a strong coupling regime. Now, this is um, what the, um, the Hamiltonian of the system looks like, and this is um, relatively straightforward. So you have the, the free optical field, the free mechanics, and then the coupling of the, of the field to the cavity. And then the interesting part is the interaction Hamiltonian between the mechanical and the optical system. So you couple the position B plus B dagger of the um, mechanics to the intensity of the light field inside the cavity. And this is done now with this coupling rate G naught that I already showed you for our system. And th this is defined as the zero point fluctuation of the mechanical systems times the derivative of the optical cavity frequency by a displacement of the cavity. So essentially, how much um, coupling do you get when you displace the, the cavity by a certain amount in, in position? And now you can imagine that the zero point fluctuation is really, really small for a real system. And this is also why um, typically, this, this coupling rate is, is quite small. I think the largest ones are around this one megahertz that we see in an optomechanic system, but typically this operates more on the hertz level, tens of hertz level for, for other kind of um, optomechanical systems. And now I already slightly hinted at this. So 
in order to now get an appreciable coupling in this optimal mechanical system what you typically do is you um, you essentially um, you pump with a strong coherent field um, the your, your cavity so you increase the coupling rate by um, the square root of the intracavity photon number and when you do this you, you essentially what you do is you you linearize your, your interaction so this is not going to be this nonlinear Hamiltonian anymore but it's going to be a linear um, linearized Hamiltonian and then you can do a rotating wave approximation and depending on your detuning you actually get different kinds of um, interactions so on the one hand you get um, a two mode squeezing interaction and on the other hand you get a beam fits interaction and if you want to think about this a little bit more intuitively so essentially for the, for the two mode squeezing what you do is what I'm plotting here is that it's the cavity response function function here in, in black and then the pump laser in, in green here so we create a Stokes and anti-Stokes um, side bends, um, where one of the, in this case, the, the Stokes side bend is resonantly enhanced by the cavity, while this um, anti-Stokes side bend is, is suppressed. So, um, and now, so essentially, effectively, you get a, a, only the Stokes side bend, the Stokes process, which is the two mode squeezing interaction in this case, and of course, vice versa. You can also pump it um, at lower frequency than the cavity frequency. So. Um, the side bend here, the anti-stoke side bend is resonantly enhanced. You um, actually yeah, enhance while the other one is suppressed. And this actually means here that you extract energy from your mechanical system into your light field and get it out of the cavity. So you create a beam splitter interaction and effectively cool your mechanical system. Whereas here you two mode squeeze your system and effectively heat your mechanical structure. <clears throat> now, using this kind of interactions, we've actually done quite a few experiments in, in this direction. I'm giving you a brief overview and then go into detail of a few more of these. So essentially what you can do is you can create um, quantum states of a mechanical system by, by pumping your cavity on these um, Stokes and anti-Stokes sidebands. Um, you can create entanglement between two of, of these mechanical systems as well as um, entanglement between the optical and the mechanical modes. You can actually use this if you, in addition, couple to like for example, a piezoelectric material, you can actually create um, a converter between microwave states and, and optical states. You can do this fully coherently. You can preserve the quantum state. So it's really something that's very interesting for, for example, connecting um, the output of a, of a superconducting qubit to an optical network. And um, people are really actively working on, on realizing something that's efficient, the right bandwidth and low enough noise to really convert the, the output signal of a, of a superconducting qubit to telecom wavelengths, ideally. And then last but not least here is, is um, you can also use your mechanical system actually as a quantum memory, which um, is um, something I will, I will show you in, in a little bit um, later. So realizing some of these um, um, systems, you use different materials. So typically we work with silicon and silicon nitride, mostly for these high frequency systems with silicon. But then for the conversion, we, we work with piezoelectric. So for example, gallium arsenide or gallium phosphide, in which we then realize this optomechanical crystal. So how can you think of actually using these kind of now interactions to create a, a quantum state of your mechanical system? So very simply put, and this is this is just a, a simple sketch of what we do. You start off with your mechanical system; it's a harmonic oscillator in the ground state, and then you come and pump your cavity with a, for example, a, a short pulse of blue detuned light. So you pump it with this two mode squeezing um, interaction, so a higher higher optical frequency than the cavity so it's detuned by the mechanical um, frequency. And most of the time, nothing will happen. So this is this one. But every now and then you will actually scatter a photon into the Stokes sideband. And that means you will create a single excitation in your mechanical system, while at the same time creating a photon that's unresonant with the cavity, right? So lower frequency, while at the same time you create a single excitation in the mechanical system. And then with the same probability squared, you excited in the second um, excited state of the harmonic oscillator and you create two photons that are unresonant with the cavity and so on and so forth. So this is effectively this two mode squeezing interaction, right? So you get a two mode squeeze state between the light field unresonant with the optomechanical cavity and your um, mechanical um, state. Now, in order to actually make this into quantum state, the mechanic and mechanical quantum state, what we do is we 
look for photons unresonant with the, with the cavity. And then if we detect one of these photons, we effectively project the mechanical system into the first excited state. So one single photon that we detect means that we actually have a single photon state of our mechanical system. Now, in order to read this out, we use this other type of interaction, which is beam spit interaction. So we pump the cavity with a red detuned pulse, so lower frequency now, and then this can be done actually quite efficiently. You de-excite your mechanical system back into the ground state, but at the same time creating a photon on resonance with the, um, of the mechanical cavity. And so if you have a single photon out here, you can actually show that you created a single photon clock state before of your mechanical state. Okay. Um, now, in order, of course, to, to be able to do this, you have to be able to, um, to put your mechanical system into the ground state. Um, we do this by simply putting the, the system into a delusion refrigerator that's 10 millikelvin, so ground state temperature for this 5 gigahertz modes is around um, 150, 200 millikelvin or so. And essentially what we do is we take this, this um, the structure here, you have two of these nano beams coupled to a single waveguide. They come with an optical fiber here from the left side, coupled efficiently to the waveguide. And then these have slightly different frequency. We can really choose which of the nano beams we work with. But what we do is then we put this in a delusion fridge, so it should in principle be fully in the ground state. And in order to verify this, we, we pump with several pulses on the, on the red detune side and on the blue detune side. And of course, you can always create excitation, so you can always go up. However, if you're in a ground state, you cannot de-excite it anymore. And so you see an imbalance between these two rates, which we call side the symmetry, and we measure the imbalance and can directly infer the temperature of the, um, of the mechanical system with this kind of measurement. And for this particular measurement, you see here, we, we showed that the mechanics is in a, in like in a thermal state of about 0.02 um, um, formats. Okay, so this is, this is good enough for calling it the ground state for an experimentalist. And what we do then is, um, well, we've done an experiment showing this, um, the, the single form of Fox state. But um, let me already look at, at the next step. So we want to create entanglement between two of these mechanical oscillators. So what we do here is we take two of them that are um, in the ground state, we put them into an optical interferometer, and then we pump this interferometer with a blue detuned pulse. So this will go to both of these um, mechanical systems. And then we recombine the paths. So we essentially um, erase any which path information. And then if we detect a single photon here in one of these detectors, we know that one of the two mechanical systems is excited in the first excited state, but we don't know which one. And therefore we created a, a tangled state between the two mechanical systems. If you write this down, you get two two mode squeeze states, you can multiply this out, and then you detect a single photon in one of the single photon detectors. So you trace out the vacuum, you um, essentially then um, remove the, the photon from, from, your, um, from your state, and you're left with this entangled state between the two mechanical oscillators. So you share a single mechanical excitation between these two oscillators that are on two different chips, 20 centimeters apart in the same delusion fridge, um, that just share a combined optical path. And you can actually verify that you created an, an entangled state by pumping um, with the red detuned pulse again, and then you use an entanglement witness um, that if greater than one, it's a separable state, and if it's smaller than one, it's actually an entangled state of these two mechanical oscillators. In order to do this, of course, um, both of these mechanical oscillators have to be perfectly the same. So you cannot, by detecting a single photon here, be able to tell which of the two mechanical oscillators emitted the photon, so which of them is excited. And in order to do this, you essentially you have to have the same optical frequency and also the same mechanical frequency, and though you can slightly compensate for a mismatch in the mechanical frequency um, with, a, with a frequency offset in one of the arms. Um, that's dependent on if it's a blue or red pulse in, in one or the other direction. So as long as the photon that's coming out here to the beam splitter is exactly the same as in the other. And this is what we do. This is what we see. So we scan the phase of the interferometer and we nicely see that there's really good interference in your second order correlation function and your entanglement witness is actually way below, um, uh, below the bound. And you see for the for the latest measurement, we really see a nice violation of this bound. So we really see that we can we can fully create an entangled state between these two mechanical oscillators. Now we can take this a step further and we can we can violate a bell inequality. So really showing that we have entanglement in the system. And the important thing here is that this is now not entanglement between the two mechanical oscillators, 
because you're you're in a state where you only share a single excitation, so you cannot do um, a, a real basis um, rotation. So what you have to do is you have to measure entanglement between the light field that's emerging from the from the interferometer and the two mechanical system. And this is what we can do as well. We can we can look at the, the correlation coefficients for a normal CHS inequality here, and we can nicely show that we actually violated bell inequality using this optimal mechanical entanglement in our in our system. All right. So now, if we want to take this a step further, if we want to really use our system beyond just demonstrating that we can create quantum states, that we can create an entangled state, if we really want to take this um, to a level where we want, where we can use this for real quantum information processing, for example, we can distribute um, the entanglement of a much larger distances than we currently can. So currently, as I, as I mentioned, we have these two op, um, optomechanical systems in, um, in a single dilution fridge about 20 centimeters physically apart and about like 70, 80 meters of optical fiber rate. But we want to ideally really bridge several kilometers or more. So we want to do some sort of um, entanglement um, distribution over large distances with various nodes and then do entanglement swapping effectively. So this is kind of the idea, like have multiple of these pairs that you entangle and then do a, do a bell state measurement on the, on the inner ones and you create essentially an entanglement between the ones that have never interacted with one another. But in order to do this, of course, you, you need like a quantum memory. And um, this is what I mentioned in the very beginning. Um, in order to, to really get very large um, quality factors and therefore you'd be able to store your, um, your quantum state, your photonic quantum state in the mechanical system for a long time, you actually have to add an additional phononic shield because the, the, the band gap that you create here with just this nano beam is not a full band gap. There's some other symmetries that can actually leak out and therefore like the, in, in your real fabrication, you will not perfectly um, separate them and therefore you have some, some loss. Um, but if you build this, um, build this phononic shield here, this is just this cross structure and here's the, the band simulation. So you see this is a real um, band gap for all symmetries between about four and, and six and a half gigahertz or so. Um, if you build this with enough um, of these of these crosses here, you can actually really nicely isolate this um, the system. And this is what's been shown in the in the painter group at Caltech. They can really they demonstrate it. You can get mechanical quality factors of up up to ten to the ten using this cross structure and such a manner. Um, now, in order to to show a quantum memory like ten to the ten, which is like a lifetime of, of several seconds. Um, would have been too long for us. We, we opted for something more on the order of, of a few million, um, simply so we can repeat our experiment more often. Um, but effectively, we can use this as a nice um, quantum memory for our, our quantum state of our, of our photons that are coming into this of the mechanical system. And what this looks like is, so a T1 time that we chose in a, in a particular system is about um, two milliseconds. So you see here, we, we measured the, the second order correlation function as a function of time. So when do we send in the second pulse to read out the state of the mechanical system? And you see this nicely only decay starting at a, at a few millisecond. And this, this first shaded area here is um, if you can still violate a bell inequality and then this here is the, is the classical bound here essentially. So the T1 is about two milliseconds in the system. Now, of course, the, the, this um, lifetime is not the only um, important quantity, but you also need to show how long you actually face coherent um, um, with your state. And this is our T2 start time. And this is unfortunately a little bit lower. So it's on the order of tens to about a hundred microsecond. And what I'm plotting here is, is the, essentially the, the lifetime or the, the T2 time as a, as a function of, of um, photon numbers. So we see when we have stronger, when we have more um, photons in our cavity, we actually have a longer lifetime. This kind of hints at, at, at some two level systems or so that that are causing these um, dephasing in a, in a um, device and, and therefore limiting our, um, our T2 star time of the mechanical sphere. Nevertheless, um, we could show that we can actually um, save a, a superposition state, um, an arbitrary superposition state of zero and one mechanical excitations in our system, in a quantum memory, and we can read it out still after tens of microseconds very faithfully. Now you might ask what, what will cause beyond just the generic um, term of uh, two level systems, what actually is causes, causing this, um, this dephasing? And what we actually observed is, we see that our mechanical system, so the mechanical frequency, the central frequency actually jitters in time. 
So you see this plotted here, how much um, this mechanical um, frequency jitters. And this is just a plot of, of, the, of the line width of this. And this can really explain um, also the, so the time scales and the magnitude can really be, um, explain the, the dephasing of our system. It's still not an explanation, of course, of why this happens. But again, this is something we, we want to look at in a little bit more detail in the, in the future to really understand of um, why do we why do we see this this relatively short um, T two star time in the system that's caused by this dephasing. But in principle, if we can get rid of this this frequency jitter in our mechanical system, we think we can we can get our T two star up, up quite a bit. All right, and now um, maybe as a as a final um, step on where we want to go. And, and what we want to do with this kind of quantum memories, we really want to look at building a, a full quantum repeater, like where we distribute entanglement over, over large distances. And in order to do this, one of the um, main experiments that you have to show is um, a teleportation experiment where you can essentially teleport um, an arbitrary input state, in this case, a photonic input state, onto a mechanical quantum memory. So this is, this is kind of the, the goal of, of what we set up to do here. So we have an an arbitrary optical input state, and we have this mechanical quantum memory now made up of two mechanical oscillators. Okay, and then we essentially um, teleport this state onto the, this memory, and then we can read it out after some some time. So this is the the way we um, we see this. So we send in um, this arbitrary optical state. We create entanglement between these two um, mechanical oscillators and an optical light field, where we essentially encode. Now these the, the shared phonon between the, the two mechanical oscillators in the polarization state of the photons. So we create an EPR state between the, the polarization of these photons and the um, single phonon excitation in these um, two mechanical oscillators. So this is our, our EPR state that we use as a resource for teleportation. And then we do a bell state measurement between the original input state and the photonic part of the entangled state, um, which then projects these two mechanical systems into the input state, and therefore we teleport um, the state onto this um, quantum memory. And then we can send in another one of these rectitude pulses here and essentially use a beam state interaction to read out the state of this quantum memory. And in principle, we can do this for um, arbitrary states um, on the block sphere, um, for arbitrary polarization input states here. And in our case, we opted for using a weak coherent state which actually brings some, some complications and makes the fidelity a little bit lower instead of a single photon state. But just to show that this, this protocol actually works, this was the simplest to realize. Now, this is what the, what the experiment itself looks like. Um, so again, we have um, these two mechanical systems in, in one arm, each of, of an optical interferometer. We pump it first with a, with a blue detuned pulse with the Stoke sideband and create entanglement, optomechanical entanglement, and then we have a polarizing beam split as an output here. So we project one arm into the vertical polarization and the other arm into the horizontal polarization. So we create entanglement in encoded in the optical part in polarization and in the mechanics um, in the phononic subspace and so the excitation subspace. And then send it to a beam splitter here, where as an input, we have this um, input state that is arbitrary input state encoded in polarization. And we do a bell state measurement here. Um, in this arm. And then we send in a rectitude pulse, read out this um, mechanical state again, and actually demonstrate in this, um, in this measurement apparatus that we created, a, um, that we really teleported the original input state um, onto the mechanical quantum memory. This is what the experiment looks like. We do this for various different um, polarization encoded input states, first in the, in the linear basis and then in the diagonal basis. and um, we actually showed it on average. So for all six different states, this is the average here between six different states, it's actually above the classical threshold of, of two thirds. So we have a fidelity of about 75%. So we really can show that this is a quantum protocol um, using this quantum memory, this mechanical quantum memory as a, as, as a target um, state of your, of your photonic input state. So this is very encouraging. Um, and we think that this is gonna be very useful for, for um, future um, quantum entanglement um, distribution and, and quantum repeaters essentially. And we wanna we wanna take this now um, a little bit further and, and potentially set up a, a bigger chain. We can really demonstrate this entanglement distribution. All right, and with this, 
I want to thank, um, first of all, my collaborators here on the, on the left that have really contributed significantly to some of these experiments. And then on the right, this is a pre-pandemic um, picture of the, of the group. It has changed now a little bit, but I thought this would be nice to, to show people before the pandemic still and, and give you a flavor of, of what the group looks like and, and who, are, who are actually working on, on these experiments. Thanks a lot for your attention and I'm looking forward to questions. Uh, okay, so uh, Simon has given us a wonderful talk. So now it's open for our questions. So you can ask your questions by pressing the raise hand, uh, raise hand button uh, in Zoom. Uh, alternatively, you can also uh, ask your questions in the Slack channel by texting. Uh, okay, so okay, so Romi, Romanian uh, Leo, Leo me. So please. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, yes, thanks for the very nice talk. Um, yeah, I have you, you mentioned that uh, it, it's possible to tune the basically the lifetime of the T1 coherence, uh, depending on how you engineer uh, your, your resonator. Uh, would this affect also the T2? If you, I mean, if you, if you opt for much longer uh, uh, storage right. time. So, so I think, yeah. So if, if you increase your T1 beyond the, the milliseconds, so say for two seconds, I, I don't think for now, at least we could increase the T2 star simply because we have this, we have this frequency jitter. I think if you would reduce it, yes, you could probably reduce the T2 star as well. Um, but I think we, we first have to find a way of, of mitigating this, this frequency jitter to, to improve the T2 star. Okay, yeah. And then do you have more insight on, on, on the reason why you have this jitter of your central uh, frequencies? So, so we, think, we think this is probably a similar reason why. So we also see um, some residual absorption of our light in the, in the mechanics. So. This is this is probably due to um, surface states um, in the fabrication. When you when you um, fabricate the silicon devices, you usually create some some hydrogen dangling bonds, and and these probably um, they they not they not fixed, so they they like move around, and we think that this causes some some disturbance in the in the frequency. But this is this is more a theory and has not actually been experimentally shown. So this is something we have to investigate a little bit further. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot, and thanks for the very nice yeah. talk. Thank you. Uh, okay, so I see a question from the Slack channel from Tafik uh, Pareso. Uh, the question is: Can a uh, can an active feedback on the mechanical frequency help improving the defacing time of the quantum memory? Simon. Yeah. Yeah, hi Taufik, thanks for the, for the question. Um, I think that's a very good question. So, so you're saying essentially if we, if we monitor the frequency and then actively feed back onto the mechanical frequency, I, I think that could work. It's a question of how, how quickly you can, you can do this. I think it's, I mean, in the end, the jitter is on the, on the kilohertz scale. So I think that should be possible. I think the bigger challenge is how do you act back on the mechanical frequency? Um, so this is something I think you'd have to probably do some um, in this case, probably optomechanical feedback, but then you, I think you, you also bring in, like you probably change your occupation to some extent. So I think this could work, but it would definitely not, definitely not be quite straightforward unless you have a good idea of, of, of how to implement such a feedback on the frequency. Mm. Okay, so uh, I have one question. So uh, uh, the entanglement generation scheme is actually very similar as what, what we do with atomic ensembles, uh, especially the DLCZ protocol, right? So uh, many similar experiments have been done uh, with atomic ensemble already. 
So uh, I'm quite interested in what is the prospect of your system, uh, in particular in comparison with uh, atomic ensembles? Mm -hmm. Right, so I think that's a very good question. I, I totally agree, of course, this is not, uh, the protocol is not new. It's, this has definitely been implemented in various different systems. I think one of the interesting things about the, um, this optomechanical um, systems is that you, that you can fully engineer your, your resonance. So you can operate at a wavelength that you, that you choose. So we do this at a telecom wavelength. So I think this is, this is quite interesting for the memory, for example, that you natively operate in the, in the telecom band. Um, and, and then also, I think in addition that you can engineer, for example, lifetimes um, quite well. And I think there's this variety of, of additional interesting um, aspects that come with, with like having a massive system. You can, you can nicely couple mechanics to other quantum systems quite well. So this is something people have been trying quite a bit to, for example, couple to spins or couple to, um, to um, microwave photons, for example. So I think there's a variety which makes it very flexible and interesting, but of course, there's also quite a few challenges. So something I haven't mentioned too much, I just alluded to before is, for example, heating or like absorption in the structure, that's quite a challenge or, or losses in general. So that the rep rate isn't super high at the moment, but the entanglement rate isn't, isn't quite that high. And I think we also have to increase the fidelity quite a bit. So I think there's some advantages and interesting aspects, but also quite a few challenges still with these systems. Okay, so so uh, how to say? Uh, I just I just have another question. So uh, with uh, I think the scheme uh, you used for entanglement generation uh, is probabilistic uh, in nature, right? So is it possible to to induce some nonlinearity to limit the excitation of second order and high order events? So. Uh, are there any theoretical proposals to mm -hmm. solve this problem? Uh, absolutely. So I think, yes, obviously this is completely linear and, and, and probabilistic. So that's, I think also with these rates is, is definitely, definitely a challenge. But so in principle, the optomechanical interaction is nonlinear. So there is, there's definitely ideas to, to use this nonlinearity. The problem and the challenge experimentally is that, that you have to be in like at least close to the strong coupling regime. Um, which I think we still two orders of magnitude away and we have been two orders of magnitude away for the past 10, 15 years. It's essentially something that's very, very difficult to, um, to get into, into the nonlinear, into like using some nonlinearity here that's, that's intrinsic to the optomechanical system. Um, but I think there's definitely some interesting proposals that, that, could, that um, could use such a nonlinearity. It's just lacking an experiment at the moment. <clears throat> Okay, thank you very much. So I see another question from Slack, uh, from Chris Morrison. Uh, his question is, do you have ideas about which type of single photon source you would use to replace the weak coherent source given the bandwidth requirements? Also, you, you mean which, which single photon source for the, as an input state for the, for the teleportation? I mean, I, I think, I think even even a standard down conversion source would actually make make things much much better already. So we've we've actually looked at the fidelity of the of the states for the weak coherent state versus like a single photon source, and it's at least ten percent or so difference in the fidelity. We would have had like about 80, 85 percent or so, I think, if we had used a just a standard down conversion source. Um, we have not looked too much into what exact source we would use. But this would definitely be something interesting. We just didn't really have the time to set it up for this experiment. But I think it would be very interesting to, to work with someone who has a, a single photon source set um, at 15, 50 nanometers to, to implement this and improve the teleportation essentially. OK, OK. Uh, thank you, Simon. So I see no further questions. Uh, so. Uh, uh, how to say, uh, after this session, I think the speaker will go to the uh, QCrypt uh, space uh, to answer further questions. So I encourage the attendees to, to, go, to, uh, uh, to go to this space. Okay, thank, uh, thank everyone and thank you, Simon. Thank you, yeah, I'll be in the meet the speaker room. See you in a bit.
Okay, see you. See you later. Bye.